so we have now seen all the rules of symmetry and how to apply those rules to actually get to the stage of symmetry operations followed by character table and all so given a molecule we can identify what are the symmetry elements present what are the symmetry operations present in the molecule what is the point group of the molecule and then using the rules of great orthogonality theorem or using unit vector transformations etc we can identify what are the ir representations and we have also seen if we write a reducible representation how to convert that into a irreducible representations so all those rules form the first part of this course and now the second part is the applications part so let us start seeing applications of group theory now okay in chemistry okay so a few applications we have already discussed for example the first one was dipole moment whether a molecule has dipole moment or not we can predict based on the rules of symmetry right and then similarly we have also seen whether a molecule is optically active or not optical activity we tested again using the rules of uh, symmetry and group theory right so these two applications we have already seen so now let us look at group theory and quantum mechanics okay so why are we discussing quantum mechanics okay we'll first introduce not introduce we'll just revise you all must be aware of this famous equation h psi equal to e psi right so what is h psi equal to e psi it's a eigen value equation it's also called as schrodinger wave equation right so what are different parts or different components here so psi is a state function also called as wave function or wave function which tells you about the state all the properties of that particular state then h is hamiltonian operator that also we know we might have studied at some point hamiltonian operator operates on a function and if it is a eigen function then it generates eigen value which is energy of the system right so basically it's an operator to measure energy so these are the main components so we have an operator we have a function and then operator operates on a function to give a constant value which is energy in this case because the operator is hamiltonian so now why are we discussing hamiltonian in group theory so if we see that there is a very important property which is if we replace or if we okay let's stick to the word replace so if we replace identical particles in a molecule uh, with the same particles or with identical particles for example if we have electron and one electron is replaced with the same electron then the energy of the system is invariant so what do i mean by that so let us say so let's say if we have a molecule let us take an example of uh, methane and let's call this configuration as configuration 1 if i am doing any symmetry operation r it goes to equivalent configuration right and let's call this equivalent configuration as 2 now if you look at let's say that the symmetry operation is c3 okay so then we'll be rotating this molecule about the ch point by 120 degree angle so now if you see that this atom is replaced with this this with this and so on right so basically particle which is the 
atomic nuclei here each of this is replaced with the identical ones and thus the energy of the system if we measure energy of uh, system 1 configuration 1 should be equal to energy of the system 2 similarly we can say about the bonds also so if this bond the electron density here is replaced with this electron density versus electron density here is replaced with this, that electron density so these are all identical particles because they have similar location with respect to any particular point in the molecule so that means that we are moving these identical particles around and in the process we are not perturbing the energy of the system right so if i want to write this statement what do i say that any two So Hamiltonian does not change or energy does not change. So that means whether I'm measuring energy first or doing a symmetry operation first, it does not matter. So in other words, what we can do is we can say that if we first measure energy on this and then carry out symmetry operation, that should be equal to if we first carry out symmetry operation on this and then measure energy, right? So there is no difference if we first measure energy versus if we first do the symmetry operation. The energy of the system remains invariant. So that tells you that HR is basically equal to RH, which means that H and R commute with each other, right? So we know what is the meaning of commutation now. So h and r so basically hamiltonian commutes with all the symmetry operations present in the given molecule okay so we can also say that the hamiltonian commutes with in a similar way we can say that hamiltonian commutes with a constant right so we can write h c psi is equal to c h psi is equal to c e psi right so similarly here we can write h r psi the only difference is that now r is not a constant r is a operator in itself right and we can say that it is r h psi and this now gives you energy so r e psi and we can actually take e out of this operator because now operator will not act on constant so we will say that e r psi right that is very straightforward to see so now we can see that since psi is an eigenfunction r psi is also an eigenfunction right so we can say r psi is also an eigenfunction right so that is easy to see now we also know that psi is normalized so now if we want uh, r psi also to be normalized what condition we will have so we will have r psi should be equal to plus minus one psi right so that means if we operate a symmetry operation onto a 
wave function which defines the state of the molecule and the symmetry operation must belong to the molecule so then that state that symmetry operation will generate a character which is plus or minus 1 because of the above condition right so this means that if we are carrying out given that a molecule has certain set of symmetry operations if we carry out all those symmetry operations on psi we will get tau psi so let's say that if we have e a b c and so on symmetry operations in a general group g then we will get plus minus one so here we'll always get plus one because it's the dimension but we will get plus minus one right so any symmetry operation if we do we'll either get plus one or minus one i mean of course if there is mixing of two states involved then we might get higher state higher dimensional representation but mostly we will see that this will be a irreducible representation because we are getting one dimensional matrix and one dimensional matrix we will not be able to reduce it further so this is this would then be a irreducible representation right so now let us take an example to show what we are saying here So let's take an example of C3V only. We have been looking at this molecule since we started this course. So we know in and out of all the character table and symmetry operations and everything. So it will be easier to see. Okay. So now if we look at the central atom, which is nitrogen, it has 2px and 2py orbitals, right? So we can take these as the basis set this is our basis set so like we took psi as the basis set here and developed a irreducible representation so this is also a wave function we can write the wave function for px orbital and py orbital and we can treat that as basis set and see what representation do we get whether it's reducible irreducible and so on okay so px orbital has the functional form of psi r sin theta cos phi and py has the functional form of psi r sin theta sin phi so i'm not going to discuss how we get this px and py that is discussed elsewhere in quantum mechanics course so we'll not go into those details so let us see what is the meaning of this r theta and phi so let us say if we have a point in three dimensional space the coordinates are x y z and length of that vector from origin is r so theta here is the angle with which it is going away from z axis okay so that angle angle which this vector is making in three dimensional coordinate system with z axis so how far down basically that vector has fallen from z axis will be called as theta okay and now if you take a projection of this vector onto xy plane so th this is the projection here this length and that projection if the angle between that projection and the positive side of the x-axis is called as phi okay so this is phi theta and r now let us see that what happens under different uh, symmetry operations present in c3v onto these theta phi and r because we need to calculate the effect of uh, those symmetry operations onto px so we should know the effect of symmetry operations onto theta phi and r right so let's say so the symmetry operations what we have here is c3v and let us discuss only 
one of the class elements and let's call this as xz and this will be our term okay so let's say what happens to r so psi r under e does it change so because r is a constant r is the length of the vector and as such e does not do anything so psi r remains as psi r right so we don't need to consider any effect of identity onto psi r okay now c3 on psi r now this is just the rotation so rotation is not going to change the length so again this will be psi r and similarly the reflection is also not going to change the length so this will also be psi r so basically psi r is invariant under any of these symmetry operations so that means the character will be plus one in it for psi r right okay so now let's see what happens for to theta so if we see carefully theta is the angle theta is the angle which is between the vector and the z axis now all our rotations are with respect to z axis right because our c3 is lying along z axis so all our rotations are about z axis so no matter how much you rotate this angle about z axis the theta will not change so that means theta 1 must always be equal to theta 2 where this is angle before symmetry operation and this is angle after symmetry operation is performed so this means other component sin theta sin theta sin theta that will also not change so that will also remain same right under both c3 as well as sigma xz now because sigma xz why sigma xz will also not change because sigma xz contains the z axis so the theta with respect to z axis will not going to be different okay so now let us look at phi so phi 2 if you are doing a c3 rotation what happens to phi 2 so phi 2 becomes phi 1 plus 2 pi by 3 right so we are taking this vector and rotating it by 120 degrees so that means your new phi will be phi plus 2 pi by 3 phi plus 120 degree so we can say that phi 2 is equal to phi 1 plus 2 pi by 3 now this means that what happens to cos phi cos phi 2 this will be cos phi 1 plus 2 pi by 3 and we can always write this as cos phi 1 cos 2 pi by 3 minus sin phi 1 sin 2 pi by 3 right so this is cos a plus b is equal to cos a cos b minus sin a sin b okay so now what happens to cos 2 pi by 3 this is minus half so you have minus half cos phi 1 and sine 2 pi by 3 is plus root 3 by 2. So you have minus root 3 by 2 sine phi 1. So cos phi 2 is equal to this. When I am doing a C3 operation. Right. So this is for C3 operation. Now let's see okay we also have to calculate for sine phi because there was one more term in phi which is sine phi right so let's also calculate for sine phi so under c3 phi 2 equal to phi 1 plus 2 pi by 3 so if we have sine phi 2 this will be equal to sine phi 1 plus 2 pi by 3 now this is sin a plus b which will be sin a cos b plus cos a sin b 
right so this again becomes minus half sine phi 1 and this becomes plus root 3 by 2 cos phi 1 now let's calculate under sigma xz what happens to phi 2 okay let's go back to the coordinate system so if you are having sigma xz phi will be reflected to minus phi right so that means i can say that phi 2 is equal to minus phi 1 okay so you can see that right my new phi will be somewhere around here right so this will be my phi so this will be a negative angle so that's why you have phi 2 is equal to negative of phi 1 so now if you want to calculate for cos phi 2 this will be equal to cos of minus phi 1 and if you want to calculate for sin phi 2 this will be equal to sin of minus phi right so this will be equal to cos of phi 1 and this will be equal to minus sine phi 1. So now that we have calculated, let us calculate the effect of this different symmetry operations onto all of the elements, which is psi r, sin theta, cos phi, and sin theta, sin phi. So now let us calculate the effect of E onto Px. Now we can do that, right? So E when operated on psi r sin theta cos phi, what do I get? So I get the same thing, right? So I get psi r sin theta cos phi, and I can say that this is Px. Now let's do the same thing for C3. If I do C3 on Px, I do C3 on Psi R, Sin Theta, Cos Phi. And what do I get here? So I'll just write down the answer here. So Psi R does not change and Sin Theta does not change, right? So I will say Psi R, Sin Theta and cos phi changes to cos phi 2 now that cos phi 2 will be given by minus half of cos phi 1 minus root 3 by 2 of sin phi 1 right? so i can say that this is minus half cos phi minus root 3 by 2 sin phi okay now i can expand this further and I can say that C3 onto Px will give me psi r sin theta minus half can come out and this will be cos phi 1 and minus root 3 by 2 psi r sin theta and we will have sin phi 1. So all I have done is I have just expanded this bracket over here to get this. And now what is this? This is minus half of Px minus root 3 by 2 of Py. So basically upon doing C3 operation onto Px orbital, it gets mixed between Px and Py orbital, right? Okay. Similarly, now we do C3 onto Py, and what do we get? We'll get C3 onto Psi R sin theta sin phi. Right? So this will now be Psi R does not change sin theta 
does not change and sine phi becomes sine phi 2 which is so I can say this is sine phi 2 and this will be psi r sine theta this I can write as minus half sine phi 1 plus root 3 by 2 cos phi 1 right so this again is coming from effect of c3 onto here effect of c3 onto sin phi 2 which gives you minus half sin phi 1 plus root 3 by 2 cos phi 1 okay now if you expand this what do you get minus half psi r sin theta sin phi 1 plus root 3 by 2 psi r sin theta cos phi 1 and this in turn can be written as minus half p y plus root 3 by 2 px right now similarly so this is for c3 ideally we should also do it for c3 square but we'll just skip it because we just want to see how the matrix is looking for the c3 operation for sigma xz what happens if we apply sigma xz onto px if we do that we will have sigma xz applied on psi r sin theta and cos phi so this gives us so psi r does not change and so is sin theta that also does not change and we have cos phi 2 right now cos phi 2 in terms of when we did sigma xz on cos phi 2 it remained same so i can write it as psi r sin theta cos phi which is nothing but px right so px remained as px now let's do sigma xz on py now we'll see that this will be sigma xz on psi r sin theta sin phi and this turns out to be psi r remains as psi r sin theta and this becomes sin phi 2 right and we are seeing that it was sin phi 2 is equal to sin of minus phi 1 and we get negative sign out so psi r sin theta sin phi which is nothing but negative of py so sigma xz on py gives you negative of py so that means if you want to write the matrix for e what we will get is 1 0 0 1 if you want to write the matrix for c3 this will be minus half minus root 3 by 2 root 3 by 2 minus half and for sigma xz this will be 1 0 0 minus 1 right so basically this comes if we are doing E onto PX and PY. We have to do it together because they are getting mixed. Then what is the form we are getting here in terms of PX and PY? And this basically helps you give this matrix. Right. Similarly, if we are doing C3 operation here, then PX gets transformed into what and PY gets transformed into what and that will give you the matrix for C3 which is this. Similarly for sigma x. Okay. 
So now there is very important thing which we want to see that this actually belongs to if we look at the trace here, this trace over here for E, C3 and sigma XZ is nothing but 2 minus 1 and 0, right? So you can say this tau Px Py for C3. Now we know that this is the trace for E representation under C3 V.2. So we can say that the tau Px Py is nothing but E representation, right? And E representation has basis as like if we write down it here e 2 minus 1 0 the unit vector basis for that is x and y okay so it is transformed as x and y so px and py orbital because they are lying along x and y so they will also transform as x and y right so they will also form the basis of e orbitals actually this is the reason why this particular function which is given by px is called as px because to start with we didn't know whether this function is lying along x axis or this function is lying along y axis but now as it turns out it lies along x and y axis which is clear from grip theory this uh, character table right so this means that we can now name this orbital as px orbital what i mean is that to start with we only had this functions we did not know whether it's px or py right when we get the result of quantum mechanics when we solve the equation we'll not go into details how we get the px and py orbitals but when we solve the equations we get this orbitals but we don't know whether it's px and py orbitals which we get to know from here that this is this indeed is px and py because it is transforming as x and y transforming as uh, e representation under c3 v.2 so we have seen today the a very important role of uh, group theory where wave functions can be taken as basis set and their properties can be discussed whether they are lying along x and y axis or not. We will see more into this when uh, we'll move to symmetry adapted linear combinations. So that's all for today. And if you have any questions, we'll discuss in interaction session. <laughs>